First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here about some of my experimental work that I have been involved with during the past few years, both in research, closer, both in research, teaching, and with my architectural office, Studio Susanne Bronson, based on the Baltic island of Rügen. I feel I should mention that I got rather excited um, when I saw the call for contributions. I instantly thought that I would probably have something to share with you on this topic. Um, the title of this short lecture is Seasonal Spontaneousness, which might already tell you that this one is not about uniform or rigid solutions, but spontaneous and pragmatic, yet quite poetic architectural practice that might be able to fly below the radar of building regulations. Um, seasonal spontaneousness is in fact linked to an idea of both seasonal design and construction in seasonal climates, such as in Northern Europe, that is reflected in seasonal typology, construction and materiality that I have explored in depth as part of my PhD research on climate responsive design and vernacular architecture in the Baltic Sea region at Technical University in Berlin. I have to quickly explain what this research is about to give this lecture some context. I have been looking into vernacular architecture around the Baltic Sea and into quite a large number of case studies. This is just a few of them, it's actually 32 in total, trying to find out about climate adaptation strategies that might be interesting today to be utilized as passive strategies in climate responsive architecture. This is not only concerning typological design principles like seasonal floor plan layouts, building shape and form, but also specific construction principles that were deployed for the seasonal climates of the north. Yes, seasonal wall dressing. One specific climate adaptation strategy that I found particularly intriguing is seasonal wall dressing. I've discovered examples, kind of accidentally stumbled upon them even. I've discovered these examples for seasonal wall dressing and vernacular architecture throughout the whole of the Baltic Sea area which basically refers to the wrapping or dressing of buildings for cold and windier months, or other non-permanent, rather spontaneously applied forms of wall cladding, as you see. Um, these wall dresses have not been applied all over, but commonly only to the most weather or wind exposed facades of buildings, making use of local natural materials that were to hand. The lovely thing about the seasonal or temporary dressing method is that this is such a smart, hands-on and easy thing to do, yet it carries a huge potential in terms of climate adaptation, material optimization, and moreover, architectural expression. And I, I would like to refer to this super nice uh, lecture of Bluff Architects with a hemp field next to the building site. Very good. Uh, this particular method of temporary dressing or patching up of buildings has not been researched a lot so far, at least not for the Baltic Sea area. This is not about patching up holes in the wall, maybe this image looks like that, but the application of supplementary insulation in certain parts of the building. It is more that through ethnographic research, some examples came to light, appearing in photographic surveys from roughly 100 years ago, and more as an accidental finding. The actual construction techniques or properties of the materials used have not been described in detail. It is more through the word of mouth, interviews that I've undertaken, undertaken with some locals, that I could find more about it. Weaving, binding and knots or textiles is the origin of architecture. Seasonal wall dressing, I guess, very much relates to Gottfried Samper's Bekleidungstheorie or the theory of dressing and actually adopting textile fabrication techniques in building construction, which is in fact very common in vernacular architecture worldwide. Wand, German for wall, which according to Samper, derived from the word Gewand or rope, and the word ceiling in German, Decke, actually translates as blanket. This idea of the dressing up of buildings for climatic reasons is something I found especially interesting to experiment with. Seasonal wall dresses came in various shapes, forms and patterns. The most common materials were reed or thatch, grass, straw, old leaves, but also seaweed or eelgrass, fern or bracken, wood branches or simply garden weeds. 
several, uh, several weaving and binding techniques have been documented of that were not only used in seasonal wall cladding, but it is also interesting to look at uh, these weaving techniques used for fencing or other less permanent types of wall construction. Wall dresses were seasonal as sometimes only applied for colder and windier months, sometimes could be defined as temporary, never applied to the whole facade, but only were actually needed, making it a very resource optimized way of insulating a building. The function is obviously an extra layer of insulation, like a winter dress or a hot jumper. The interesting idea behind the strategy is that the building is made fit for winter, where certain wall build-ups were enhanced according to season. This extra layer was not seen as a permanent part of construction, but a layer that is there to meet climate forces instead of the load-bearing building structure itself. It is temporary because it will, it will most likely need replacing, more often, more frequently, like a change of a piece of clothing. It might get destroyed by wind, rot in the rain, or simply decompose at some point, and that's perfectly okay. Then it remains, would be tossed into the fireplace. This was the case with some vernacular wall dresses. This is maybe not something I would propose today to adopt one-to-one, -one, but more with an idea of a fully compostable or recyclable piece of very efficiently designed and bespoke piece of facade construction. One major challenge in northern climates is wind in combination with low temperatures. Wind does accelerate convective heat transfer through external walls, so this cooling effect was met to the supplementary insulation of wall cladding. Typically applied facing the main wind direction and where dwelling parts of the house were located. Severe weather like storms will occur more frequently with climate change, we all know that. And wind can cause significant damage in buildings, which makes the wall dressing strategy even more interesting to explore. In vernacular architecture, the response to certain climate elements had to be negotiated or prioritized. For example, the architectural response to wind over the one to precipitation. For this particular research area, the Baltic Sea area at least, I can say, roof overhangs were for example avoided and especially wind-shaped buildings were preferred, which in return meant that rain, snow and also sandstorm would hit facades directly. Frequent repairs or repainting of facades could be avoided by applying wall cladding to the most weather and wind exposed parts of the building to protect the external wall construction from damage as well. Depending on landscape and vegetation, uh, several locally available natural materials have been used for seasonal wall cladding. Whatever worked, grass, heather, willow, or juniper, reeds, seaweed, often types of water plants actually, that could deal with moisture better than others. Bracken or fern, I don't know the Latin word, was reported of to have been a common material for seasonal external wall insulation on the peninsula of Fischland Das in northern Germany, where large areas of coastal forests are covered in it. It is also here, on the peninsula of Fischland in Germany, where a whole farmstead was wrapped in such, leaving only a small window to look out from soft walls, roof, everything. It must be assumed that some of the thatch would be removed during warmer months when the heating up of external walls or the transfer of solar energy into the building would have been a wanted scenario. Thatch as an external layer applied to facades as prefabricated mats has been reported of from Denmark like 100 years ago with a traditional size of 125 by 190 centimeters. The same was reported of from Sweden, applied with a layer of juniper, juniper branches underneath. I've discovered several photographs of similar reed cladding in archives in Stockholm, Riga, Helsinki, Tallinn, so all over. So from the whole Baltic Sea research area, really. Seaweed, or eelgrass in particular, was a material commonly used on smaller islands as durable and waterproof material for roofing, insulation, and wall coverings. Basically, in parts of the research area, wherever thatch or timber was scarce, such as on the Danish island of Leso, and I'm so happy I met a resident of the Danish island of Leso on the first night here of the conference, <laughs> which is especially famous for its eelgrass roofs. The use of seaweed in facades and roofs, or as wall insulation, is also documented off from northern Germany, in particular from the island of Pöhl. 
Some seasonal wall dressing or cladding methods utilize the using up or eating up of insulation from natural materials through winter towards spring, as it would need replacing for the next season uh, due to decomposing. From northern Germany and Poland, it was reported that heaps from a mix of straw, old leaves, and other garden waste called zagata were piled up in front of the facade and then used as firewood during winter, including the straw mats. For that, wooden sticks were placed in rows in front of the facade and then filled up with all sorts of material, whatever there was. Also hay that could be fed to animals during winter. These heaps commonly reached up to the roof, covering the whole facade. Photographic archival material from the Baltic states show piles of timber, branches, straw mats, and other natural material piled up against weather-exposed facades and parts of the roof, both securing the stability during winter storms as well as for additional insulation. It can be assumed that these heaps were also used as firewood during winter. Patterns of seasonal or other non-permanent dresses were not at all just ornament. The combination of several materials, such as reed with straw or seaweed, and then the diagonal fixing of straw bundles or willow and hazelnut branches, led to a specific pattern or ornamental expression. Individual material properties determined the pattern of the wall or the dress, as for example, it's the, it is only straw or grass that could be braided, seaweed knotted or twisted, and reed woven. Seasonal wall dressing from living vegetation as ivy coverings or creepers like vine is a widespread and common strategy to balance indoor climates of buildings. A growing number of studies has recently been looking into the effectiveness of vegetated walls. And it has been found that it can reduce heat transfer through external walls significantly, resulting in energy savings for as much as 8% during the colder time of the year. Another study has found even 25% of energy savings for buildings with fully vegetated west and south facades. These studies were carried out using simulation programs. However, they were acknowledging the limitation of the study due to the random quality of natural materials and that field experiments are necessary to validate computer simulation. Okay, experiment one. The first phase of the seasonal wall dressing experiment started last year in August in working with a very wind-exposed western facade of an existing building on the Baltic island of Rügen. This is wind zone four, German wind classification for structural engineers, so pretty seriously stormy throughout the whole year. The building used for the experiment, an East German EW58 serial type house, is a topic in itself and being a sort of experimental house for me that I have converted and where I have been testing certain climatic design principles identified through my research, while also living in it and observing. But uh, this would go too far now to explain maybe some other time. At least I can report that I was quite bothered with this particular west-facing weather and wind-exposed facade that needed constant repainting, repairs to damage render, and that actually was very much prone to cooling from wind. So I was affected on a personal level, I would say, too. My idea was uh, to develop a modular facade system consisting of removable frames of one by one meter that could be dressed individually each year, depending on which materials I would have to hand. The main thought behind it was that this facade system should be easy to handle, hence the size of the frames, so that basically everyone would be able to use it. The frames themselves were made of two by four pine wood. The first thing I wanted to find out about was not so much concerning the performance in terms of energy savings, but to give it a first go in experimenting with the application of a few natural materials, whether they would be suitable or not, or how they would act under real life conditions. For example, I dressed one of these frames with an off-the-shelf reed mat, but I folded it several times, uh, so there were three layers on top of each other, resulting in a thickness of about five centimeters. And then I tied it to the frame, using hamstring. The seaweed was a bit of a challenge. I had no clue how to use it, but I observed through old photographs that traditionally it was twisted to rolls. I had to experiment a little bit to find the right type of seaweed, which was eelgrass, 
and the right consistency or wetness of it. In the end, I basically twisted it to rolls quite firmly with a diameter of about, of about five centimeters as well. Uh, and organized the seaweed rolls vertically by hanging them tightly next to each other into the frame and then weaving some string through them to create one big patch. The frames stayed in place for one year exactly, exposed to weather and wind. The reed only changed color from golden to gray, but stayed in shape. The seaweed dried up further and shrunk significantly, leaving gaps in between the rolls, forcing me to overthink my technique. You can see the, it's not really a failed frame, I don't want to call it that, but it's in the bottom right, maybe a bit small. Um, obviously, I learned something. The modular frames were a good idea, I still think so, in, in cultivating this vernacular technique a bit further that I think would hold the potential for a more advanced system even. On the other hand, it took a while to build all these frames. We just had the same problem. And I only managed to produce a few ones myself, so it would require some professional help in order to cover a larger surface of the facade. The second phase, the, the next experiment, uh, took into account these findings from phase one. And I wanted to extend these material experiments and including more and more materials. And the new setup was more inspired by a big loom stretching across the whole of the facade. There was still, it was still a modular idea as it consists of a row of vertical large battens, seven by four, fixed to the wall in a distance of about 50 centimeters and wire running horizontally in a distance of about 20 centimeters in between them. The depth of the large battens, seven centimeters, so quite deep actually, was chosen so that several natural materials could also be stacked into it if needed, a bit like in a shelving system. So this loom, loom setup still leaves the option to place modular frames into it, uh, for example, as vegetated frames that could be prepared off-site. The phase two experiment, on the contrary to the first experiment, enables the dressing of the wall in a more spontaneous manner directly into the loom or directly onto the wall. Weaving, binding and knots, I really like that. <laughs> and the textile as inspiration, the, the seasonal wall dressing experiment was very much inspired by the beautiful works by the Bauhaus artist Gunther Stölzel or the fantastic and also meaningful work of Sheila Hicks. I thought this vernacular technique maybe of wall dressing could possibly be translated into something similar. It required a little bit of design work in advance, actually, in developing a basic pattern for the dress. First of all, the dividing up of the existing facade into sections required tracing and an interpreting of its geometry. The location of openings presented a wonderful disturbance to the regularity of the system, resulting in a unique grid of large patterns that would later on steer the more detailed pattern development of the dress. The different materials or different natural materials and their properties would lead to different geometries. The island workshop took place this August with students from Hochschule Wismar, Riesebar University in Riga, we have been teaching the last semesters, and Tartu School of Architecture in Estonia. To understand the possibilities that lie in the application of several different materials, we've experimented with several techniques of wall dressing, both with off-the-shelf products, thatch and willow mats, and natural materials harvested from my garden, which had too much weed in it anyway, because I never have time to tend to my garden. A big thank you to a local timber manufacturer who sponsored the large buttons. This drawing is in fact partly early design planning or pre-dressing, and partly a survey after the dressing had started. It is nice, I, I think it's very nice that some traditional techniques are merged with experiments taking the idea of seasonal wall dressing with natural materials a step further. We also got some uh, very valuable input from uh, a Finnish te textile artist, Timo Pitgeme, who brought some of his beautiful works along and taught us weaving and knotting techniques, which was then directly tested with seaweed or eelgrass eel woven into chicken fence, as you can see here on the right-hand side. It actually worked pretty well. Uh, okay, now I can't switch forward. Oh, yes. Yes. So this is us uh, giving it a go. It was really fun, <laughs> actually. No one got hurt. Um, 
So seasonal wall dressing is also, in fact, a rather entertaining activity. This was day two. The wall dress pattern starts to show. We've experimented with reed mats, willow mats, loose reed, grass, summer flowers, lavender blossoms harvested from the garden, hazelnut branches woven into a mat and then stuffed with seaweed, living heather plants planted into seaweed nests into the facade. Unfortunately, it was the only weekend in this super dry summer when it was raining for a whole day. So we did not get finished completely, uh, but that's not a problem. I will be quite happily resuming on my own. The dressing was a very open experimental act, I think. Each student was completely free, apart from vaguely considering the geometry of the dress developed in advance that was sketched onto the facade before we started. In terms of materiality and techniques, we obviously took the reference from vernacular tradition, but I felt um, I would just let the students work free to find out which application technique was best, most interesting, also the easiest to support the spontaneous idea and which of them would result in the most beautiful pattern for the dress. So the uniqueness of each student's ambition is also reflected in this dress. So in terms of the, the performance, that was the initial idea as well, the seasonal wall dress will be monitored for reduction of heat losses through the cold season. This will happen through the comparison of energy used in kilowatt hour on average, comparing it to previous years. The insulating effects of each woven or knitted pattern of material will be tested through the use of a thermal camera, but that has to happen in winter, of course. So this, this experiment very much, I think, is aimed at exploring this, the, the method or technique of seasonal wall dressing, the properties of these materials that we've experimented with. And what I really like about it is that uh, it's a very accessible technique, so everyone could use it. It's actually, it doesn't require craftsmanship, it doesn't require an architect, so no work in there for me. Uh, but since this island where I'm working on has the, yes, it actually is the, one of the areas in Germany with the lowest incomes and people, I think maybe it's interesting um, to, to sort of reconsider some of these techniques where you can actually really um, work very locally from the garden. Thank you very much. <laughs>